Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin and it's time for your weekly wrap up and I wanna begin first as we always do by thanking our newest Patreon supporters. We've got John Simon, Denver and Marius Panariu. We also have some folks who gave via the tip jar including Ramon de Vrede and I got his name wrong the first time he contributed via Patreon so he gave via the tip jar this week. Uh, one of the things that happens is that I'm uh, doing these slides up in Apple Keynote and it does often autocorrect names as I'm typing them in so I've been very careful about that lately but I uh, missed that one so I apologize for that. We have Andreas Debay who gave via the tip jar, William Miller who gave via the tip jar and hit gold level status as well as Chris Allegretta who upgraded his Patreon account to gold status as well. I want to thank everyone who contributed this week and all weeks and everyone who watches on a regular basis too because all of those things equal channel growth. And this week's ad comes once again from the eye roller. They're going to be back for another two weeks. And if you missed my previous ads about this, what this is is a little screen cleaner that you can throw in your bag. It doesn't require any liquid, so it's not gonna leak out all over the place. And all you have to do here is just open it up to get your screen clean. And they've got another one here that I didn't cover before, which is called the mini eye roller. So you've got a big one and a little one here. So if you're just trying to keep your phone clean, uh, the mini one might do the trick. And the way this works is you just open it up like so, and you take out your dirty phone here, you run it back and forth for a pass or two, and you'll immediately get a much cleaner surface than what you had before. It leaves a pretty nice border there between uh, clean and dirty. So I can take it here and get the rest of the screen uh, cleaned up here, and there you go, almost good as new, except the fact that my iPhone is all scratched up. It picks up a lot of dirt and other stuff as well, so it's more than just fingerprints here. So I've got this phone, which had some dust buildup on it, and as you can see here, it leaves a nice uh, border on that, uh, again, without any liquid or anything like that. It stays sticky for a long period of time, and when it gets unsticky, you just have to run it under some water with some dish soap, let it dry out, and you'll be sticky again and good to go. Great little stocking stuffer for the upcoming holiday season and nice to have in your bag to keep your devices clean. So let's take a quick look at the week in review. On the Extras channel, I unboxed an Acer Aspire 1, which is a sub $250 PC. Pretty nice little computer from uh, the review that I just did on it. Uh, we're gonna have something coming up that I unboxed, the Lenovo ThinkPad Yoga 370. And that's a little more expensive than the Acer, but it might be appealing to some of you. I also got in a 3D action camera. Didn't seem to get a lot of enthusiasm from viewers of the Extras channel. I'm gonna probably uh, delay that one a little bit just because there's no place to buy it yet, but I will start playing around with it and see how it works. It's not a 360 camera, it's a 3D camera, which I think might have uh, some potential uses for folks now that we have more options for viewing 3D content with cardboard and everything else. On the main channel, we did a review of that Acer laptop. I also took a look at the CalDigit TS3 Thunderbolt dock. What's interesting is that there are not many Thunderbolt docks that are cross-platform. In other words, Mac and Windows, uh, this one is. You can see all of the intricacies as to how it works in that review. It's a single cable solution too, so it'll charge your laptop while you hook up your monitor and devices and whatnot. We also looked at Plex and how it now supports live TV on the web as well as Amazon Fire TV and Stick. And we looked at the Techlast T Book 16 tablet review, another one of those cheap devices from China that might be of interest to some of you. So you can see all of that linked down below in the master playlist. I did have uh, two follow-up things to talk about on that Acer. Uh, the first came in from Alan Welk, who's wondering how companies make any money selling laptops like this with a 14-inch 1080p display for but at least in this case, $220. And I think this is all about a volume play. I've also found that on these $200 computers, there's always some sacrifice made. Uh, in the case of this Acer, it is storage. It only has 32 gigabytes of onboard storage, which is beginning to be a bit of a cumbersome uh, thing for people who are looking to use Windows on a regular basis. So that was one uh, little uh, sacrifice there. The other one here, of course, is the display. It's a TN display, not all that great, uh, but it does get the job done. And for 220 bucks, it actually is a pretty nicely performing computer. And speaking of storage, NeuroBioBoy wrote in wondering if the M2 port that he saw in my teardown might be used for an SSD instead of the wireless that it is currently being used for uh, from the factory. So here's a close-up image of that slot, and it appears as though you probably could pop that wireless card out. You would lose your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in the process, but of course you could hook up a USB adapter for that, and then you could slide in an M2 SATA drive, and I believe it should work. There's really no reason why it shouldn't. I unfortunately don't have one here uh, to test that out with, but uh, I think it probably would work, and I think some of you have written in in the past saying that you've done similar things 
things on other low-cost laptops. That might be a way to get a little more storage onto that device, but you will, of course, sacrifice your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. It would be really cool if somebody were to make a uh, unit that encompassed both storage and Wi-Fi on a single card, and that would uh, maybe give us the best of both worlds if something like that existed. But in the meantime, you'll have to swap out one for the other. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind, and this is week 27 of my full-time operation here, and I am uh, very happy to say that our part-time person started on Friday, and it was a great first day for him. His name is Corey. Uh, you'll see him at some point uh, poking up in one of these videos, and I had him uh, start working on getting a bunch of PCs ready for review, so he's already got three of them ready to go. In fact, I reviewed one of them already, that uh, Acer $220 laptop. He shaved about probably about two hours off my workflow at least just for that one computer so that was a huge help to me uh, I was able to get the, the shoot done a lot quicker than I did before and he of course did all of the prep work to get that computer ready for me to evaluate so this was a really good uh, starting point for us and it was only the first day so I think as time goes on here he will uh, continue to help out making things more efficient here in the space and hopefully I'll have a lot of content just uh, queued up and ready to go so I'm not just running from one video to the next and maybe get a weekend every once in a while that I can take off so I'm really excited to report that all is good so far he'll be in a couple days next week as well some news this week of interest the first is that uh, the FTC has settled some complaints against some let's play YouTube stars over that CSGO lotto debacle I think uh, Phil DeFranco had a video about that and I think also H3H3 did something on it as well I'll put links to those down below in the playlist so you can see exactly what the CS lotto thing was about but basically there was people uh, being paid to talk about CS lotto and we're not disclosing that they were and uh, they were basically encouraging kids to gamble money away not so good uh, they also though sent some uh, demands to uh, other influencers on different platforms including Instagram to have them uh, disclose to the Federal Trade Commission the relationships that they have with brands that they've been talking about uh, there's no fines or actions going on with those but uh, they are starting to take interest not only in brands that are paying for content appearing on the web but also now starting to focus on influencers also uh, which is why I do the disclosures that I do because everybody needs to do them and a lot of people are not and the FTC is beginning to signal that they've had enough of it uh, so right now they're doing the nice thing which is sending a letter and asking for some conversation but at some point those letters will become different types of communications and a lot of influencers could find themselves in some trouble and the FTC not only goes after influencers they also go after brands for violating privacy and they have settled with Lenovo over the Superfish adware controversy from a year or two ago I'll put a link to a video I did on that down below as well so you can get some context for it uh, basically what's going to happen here is that Lenovo has to get permission of the user to install uh, software that doesn't come from Microsoft on a new computer. That was one of the settlements that they made with uh, the FTC in addition to paying some money. Uh, they also settled their case with a number of attorney generals across the United States here, including mine here in Connecticut. So it looks like that case is closed, and I think we will not be seeing any bloatware on Lenovo machines from here on out. They certainly learned their lesson. And again, you can check out my video down below to get more context about this whole thing. And now it is time for some Q&A from you, the viewers. And I got a couple of questions in from two YouTube Red subscribers. Uh, curious about how YouTube Red impacts me as a creator. And I am a YouTube Red subscriber also. And what I do is pay 10 bucks a month to the uh, mothership. And uh, in exchange, I don't get any ads on anything that I watch on YouTube, no matter what device I'm on, unless, of course, a creator bakes an ad into the video like I just did a few minutes ago. And it's been working very well for me as a viewer. And I didn't think it was doing as well for me as a creator, but I did some number crunching this morning, and I was surprised with the results. So let me tell you a little bit about about, uh, how YouTube Red works. So 55% of what you pay to Red goes to creators. Now this is not a one-to-one -one correlation though. Revenue is pooled and it's paid out by total number of YouTube Red minutes watched. So what happens is, is that uh, your share of your YouTube Red revenue goes into this big pool and uh, everyone is paid out based on the number of minutes that were watched by YouTube Red members in the aggregate. So if you watched me and only me uh, with your YouTube Red account, I will not get all of the money that you're putting in there. I'm going to get my share of the minutes uh, that all YouTube Red watchers watched in the aggregate. So some of the money you're paying in is going to creators that you're not watching because 
you know, someone like uh, PewDiePie or H3H3 or something will get a significantly higher share of the minutes than I will get, but everybody is getting paid for the minutes watched. And I guess the amount you get paid per minute is basically how much uh, money's in the pool and how many people watch that month. So I think if somebody has a really hot video, uh, that might dilute the pool a little bit more than, uh, than not. But what I did is I took a look at the year. So uh, YouTube Red Views accounted for only 4% of my overall views this year so far. So that is certainly a very small sliver. Uh, but the revenue is not as bad as I thought it was. So uh, of my YouTube revenue right now, 10% of it comes from YouTube Red. The other 90% comes from uh, the YouTube ads that run. However, I was shocked by this figure when I ran the numbers here. Uh, I am only getting $1.90 per thousand views of YouTube ad revenue uh, versus $5.02 per thousand with Red. So if everybody on this channel subscribed to YouTube Red, uh, I would be getting more money from the YouTube Red subscriptions than I would from the YouTube ads. And the reason why this number is only $1.90 and it's so low is that this is cost per view overall. Because remember, every Red view is monetizable uh, whereas every ad view is not necessarily monetizable. I'm not even talking about the demonetization scandal going on right now. This is uh, strictly the fact that YouTube does not run an ad on every video that gets played. They don't want to run too many ads to uh, turn people off from watching the platform, but because YouTube also has so much inventory, it's impossible to put an ad on every single video. So if we look at uh, the real you know, apples to apples here, uh, not the monetizable videos versus the non-monetizable, but the actual views in the the aggregate, I'm doing much better with red than I am uh, with the regular YouTube ad system. But enough people have to get on the YouTube red platform for this to actually be a thing for us. Right now it is doing better than the ad revenue is, but I'm getting so few views on it that I'm not really benefiting from it. So uh, more people do have to sign up. It would be nice if YouTube provided affiliate links to us creators so we could get you know, a little commission for getting people to get signed up like I do with Plex or something, because I do think we could sell a lot more subscribers than they are selling right now, even with all the exclusive content that nobody seems to want to watch. So hopefully uh, this will continue to be a thing and it might help a lot of creators, especially those getting hit with those ad uh, demonetization problems. And Nicholas Cheney wrote in about Netflix making an APK available for devices that can't get the app on the Google Play Store. So if you've been following some of my uh, Chinese tablet reviews lately, the, most of those devices aren't certified by uh, Netflix and therefore are not getting the app available to them in the Google Play Store. Oddly enough, Netflix just lets you download it and sideload it from uh, their uh, website here. So there's a link down below where you can find the official Netflix APK direct from the source. Uh, you click on it, install it, and your non-certified device will get Netflix once again. I don't know why they're making people go through these hoops if they're going to let them run it anyhow, but uh, that's what it is. So if you did pick up a cheap tablet and you can't get Netflix on it, uh, here's a great and safe way to get it done. And Commander Alexa writes in about antivirus and is curious about what I'm doing and maybe what some best practices are. So I might turn this question over to you in a minute, but uh, I'll tell you what I'm using for antivirus. I've got Windows Defender on my Windows computers, and I do run an occasional malware byte scan to make sure I'm not missing anything. Now, generally, I'm not browsing the web much on my Windows computers. I am mostly a uh, Mac user day to day, but I do use Windows for testing here in the lab, of course, but also uh, for playing games and some other tasks that I use Windows only for. But about 85 to 90 percent of my computer usage is on the Mac. Now, what the Mac does is they have a, a silent malware scanner that runs uh, behind the scenes that's updated without the user even knowing about it. They do push down security updates obviously through OS 10, but they also have a Windows Defender-like thing that also runs in the background to protect against some of the more popular uh, Mac malware that's out there. There are a growing number of Mac threats out there, but of course Windows is still uh, the primary mechanism. But the other thing that I do is I run an ad blocker. I know this is something that uh, is, is controversial, and I certainly hope you turn that ad blocker off when you're looking at YouTube, but uh, the reason why I run an ad blocker is that sometimes you might end up on a website that uh, you're not familiar with or maybe you just get there by accident and some, somewhere on that site is some malicious code that might uh, inject itself onto your uh, computer. And that is something that I experienced at my last job where I had a few uh, people who were uh, doing nothing wrong. They were going on their lunch break to look at a message board or something from a website that they visited all the time. And what do you know, there was an ad there that had some malicious code injected on it because the owner of that website doesn't control what those ads are. And uh, those are coming in from ad exchanges. There's no central authority to test whether or not ads have viruses in them or not. And 
We had one computer in the span of a month get infected with a uh, piece of ransomware that almost got the entire network. We literally pulled the plug out of the computer to prevent it from spreading. Uh, we had another one that also got a root kit that even malware bytes couldn't get rid of. It just kept coming back. We had to just wipe the computer out and start all over again. And uh, I found uBlock Origin here to be a good one. It runs across different platforms and different browsers. I run it on my Mac and on Windows, and I turn it off for sites that I trust where I know the ads are not coming from unknown sources. And uh, this seems to be working quite well as an additional uh, preventative measure. Uh, but good practices are really the key. You really got to make sure you're not going to these sketchy websites all the time and you're not clicking on links that are coming to you randomly. And if the link that you're being offered sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I continually filter out uh, people trying to hit you all up with free Steam keys and all this other garbage. That's usually uh, an, an invitation, essentially, to get your computer infected. Uh, but one of the things that I am very interested about, and this is going to be my Q&A for you, uh, is what you all are doing. And I'm also eager to see if there are any good uh, consumer hardware solutions that you're coming across that might be worth talking about here on the channel. Because uh, I'm thinking that an antivirus these days may not be as effective as maybe something that's sitting on your network monitoring the network traffic for anything that looks out of place. Because we know there are root kits that can get uh, into these Windows PCs and the Macs, I'm sure, as well, that are completely undetectable, yet are uh, doing some pretty nasty stuff to you and your privacy. So I would love to see if there's any hardware solutions that are out there that might be worth taking a look at. I'd also like to hear from you about how you are protecting your computers, too. And our channel of the week this week brings us back to a simpler time before you could get infected on every street corner of the internet. And that is the Internet History Podcast from Netscape to the iPad. They basically look at uh, the beginnings of everything that we use every day. And one of his recent interviews here was with uh, one of Facebook's first senior software engineers about the early days of that company. Lots of good interviews on this podcast, and I think you will find it very interesting to hear from some of the people who made the things that you use every day. So this week, I've got a couple of new things we'll be using almost every day, hoping to finally get to my review of the Alienware laptop once I get caught up on a few other less expensive things first. Uh, we're also going to be taking a look, hopefully, at that microscope I talked about last week. Things just show up here, and then it knocks my uh, plan off track, but we will try to get that quick microscope review up shortly. I think it might be a fun little gift idea. Curious to see how much it can see, so that's what I'm going to be testing with it. I've got another inexpensive laptop coming in from Asus. Uh, this one's about 400 bucks, also powered by Apollo Lake, but I think we might have a nicer display and more storage with this one. So we'll be looking at that one maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. And I got in the New Tech Connect Spark. You're going to see this unboxed on the Extras channel first. And uh, this is something that I'm going to be using with my TriCaster, but it works with other things also. And uh, what it does is it becomes a network video capture device. You can plug in a video camera or a game console or anything into that HDMI port and be able to capture footage over the network. And uh, this is something that uh, New Tech, the makers of the TriCaster, are using with their video switching hardware because if you can picture this, let's say you're on a college campus and you want to uh, broadcast something to the web from a classroom but integrate it with your uh, production workflow. You could stick one of these things in the classroom. Once it's on the network, the TriCaster sees it and you're broadcasting HDMI video from the camera right into your production facility. And on a smaller scale, in my house at least, I can bring it anywhere in the house and shoot stuff live to my TriCaster in the same way. Uh, but it also works with other software also. So I think XSplit works with this. I think there's already a uh, plug-in for OBS as well. And you can basically uh, have your gaming computer somewhere other than when you're, where you're streaming from and bring in that content over your network. It also works wirelessly too. And it's got a recorder built in. So there's a lot of stuff to test on this thing. I've been very excited about this device because it will make some things easier for me uh, in the studio. So we'll be playing with this one hopefully tomorrow, and uh, you'll see something on this later in the week as well. Now, if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash Patreon and make a monthly contribution. We also have the tip jar set up at lon.tv slash tip jar. And if you're outside the U.S., PayPal has been working quite well for a number of folks who've been helping the channel, so you can give directly via PayPal to lon at lon.tv. And we still have our ongoing program with Plex, so if you sign up for a free Plex account at lon.tv slash Plex, we get a small commission for that. You can also gift a Plex Pass subscription to somebody that you know or love or even hate at lon.tv slash Plex gift. We also have a number of channels that you may not know about. We have the Extras channel, which is uh, where I unbox stuff and have some supplementary content. The podcast, which has audio forms of this show, as well as some other interviews that I do, is at lon.tv slash podcast. The Snippets channel is at lon.tv slash snippets channel, where I 
pull out components of other things and put them into searchable uh, smaller bite-sized pieces. And that's something Corey is going to be working on to flesh out with more content. And of course, we have the live streams that I've archived at lon.tv slash live streams. I hope to do more of those uh, very soon. I do suggest you click on that notification bell so that you get a notification every time I add something new to the channel, which is quite frequently. So be sure to do that. Uh, we also have an email list at lon.tv slash email. I've got another edition coming out soon. My Facebook page is at lon.tv slash Facebook. And then the store is at lon.tv slash store, where I sell the things that I recently reviewed and paid for at a discount to you because they are used items at this point. Uh, the HP MX150 gaming laptop is up there right now at a lower price than you can get new. In fact, you can't even find them new right now. I also have that uh, Acer coming up for sale very shortly as well. And you can get an alert every time I make a change to the store at lon.tv slash store alert. So that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. I want to thank you all for your continued support of the channel. Uh, so definitely keep those questions and comments coming to keep me on my toes. And I greatly appreciate all of the things that you're doing to help keep this channel on the upward swing for growth. This is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters including Gold Level supporters, the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, John Prawl, William Miller, and Charlie Walden. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.